so many businesses are just, let me just automate everything. I am very much a ready, fire, aim individual. Like I wanna just get stuff going, see if it works, give me a signal, and then if that signal is positive, then I think of ways in which to automate it. So build things manually first. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns. This is the show where we share cutting edge strategies and acquiring leads and sales for your business so that you can achieve your vision. And Kasim Aslan, this has been a busy, busy week for you. This has been you versus Google, which we should probably leave some links in the show notes to uh, highlighting John Moran, you, a bunch of your uh, brilliant folks over there at uh, Solutions 8. So I'm amazed that you're actually still standing after doing this for like two days straight. And now you're doing a perpetual traffic podcast. Well, all so. the lift is on John. He does the heart. He's the brains. <laughs> I just introduce him. And then I, I, I made a joke earlier. I said that John is like chat GPT. He's only as good as is how well you prompt him. So, you know, if you ask him good <laughs> yeah. questions. You're the prompt. Yeah. I'm so I'm the prompter. So I might be the most important well, part of the process now that I think about it. Think about it this way, though. ChatGPT is really dumb, yeah. actually, but the prompt is the That's difference. That's right. So, in case you try and minimize your importance, you can just say, like, John's just the guy with all the data. Right. You just aggregate it with it a good prompt. Him. You yeah. have, it's up to you to pull I'm it out of him. Here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. As long as you think that way, that's the most important That's right. thing. Uh, so yeah, so uh, that was that was a lot of fun. Where can people actually find that? Is it on your YouTube channel? Because I just appeared there a few minutes ago, and I don't even know where it appeared. So we'll leave links in the show notes. But do you have like a quick link? Maybe something you want to promote here? Yeah. So the uh, chan the challenge is private. If they wanted the recordings, they could buy them at uversusgoogle.com forward slash VIP. Um, mm -hmm. the challenge is meant to promote our Google ads mastermind though. We launched a Google ads mastermind called you versus Google join the Google ads rebellion. And what we're doing is we're just taking all the smartest media buyers in the world and we're putting them in a room together. It's 500 bucks a month. And, uh, it's really meant to be about the community. So, you know, we, we hold a, a weekly, uh, get together town hall powwow. There's a group Slack channel recorded content. Uh, our strategists are there to help, you know, explain teach what it is that we're learning. But the hope is the value really comes from the membership, um, just like yeah. any other mastermind. So if you're a media buyer specifically interested in Google, and it's by application only, so we're vetting people. You have to manage at least $10,000 a month in ad spend. You have to work with Google professionally. Uh, believe that you're in the top 3% of all marketers, not auto-apply Google ad recommendations, none of those types. Um, and this could be good for you. Yeah. All right. So that, it's an actual... You're really screening applicants. Oh, here, dude. So you're not, and you're we're not capping just, it at 100 You're not people. just taking everyone's money. No. Ah, yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. The point isn't, it's not really meant to be, strictly speaking, a profit center. The problem is, is it's all getting so hard that we know we're not going to be the source of answers for very long. And so the mm -hmm. idea is, man, if we can take all the smartest media buyers and put them in a, a container that we have full visibility to, we now get to stay ahead of the curve, provide the best content. Etc. Which is again the reason that we're capping it at a hundred is because that will be like a self-perpetuating uh, optimization, you know, like that community as people burn off the applicants that are in the waiting list are brought in based off of their proficiency because you're going to have churn in a mastermind, mm -hmm. of course, for sure. But it is all self-serving for your you everything know, I do is self-serving financial though. remuneration as well as your. Uh, uh, you know, edification. Yeah, I, I do nothing for the good of humanity. This will make me a copious amount of money. It's true. I think it's important that we're just completely upfront with yeah. that. Yeah, dude, I, I run a I run a mastermind that it, on the homepage of the mastermind says something to the effect of, uh, "The only mastermind on earth solely dedicated to obsessive growth, power, and wealth accumulation." Like we are not shy about mm. our capitalist tendencies. I love that. I love it. It's why maybe one of the reasons why I loved it so much when we were in Mexico. So we'll uh, if you haven't if you haven't seen the video of us on the yachit. Yacht, is it yachit or yacht? Yacht. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's yacht Kentucky yeah. for yacht. For yacht. That's Kentucky for yachit. And it's actually on a catamaran. So we'll leave a link to that one uh, in the show notes here, as well as the URL for what was it, you versus Google dot com. Is Google. that the Okay, in case somebody wants to get in on that that fun. Um, 
So yeah, so one of the things that we talked about and it was, uh, you asked yours truly to come on, which I did. Uh, I hacked together a presentation in about 20 minutes and it took me about 20 minutes to, to recite it. So uh, we're going to be going through that here today, which is where Google and Meta are, they, they love each other. Uh, it's a love fest. This case study is all about Meta loving Google and Google loving Meta. It's a Meta and Google orgy. Yeah, yeah. And I, I joked at the beginning of the presentation, I couldn't find the heart emoji for my hack together presentation. Uh, so I just put a plus sign. You know how you used to do like, you know, K-A plus name of, sure. you know, initials of girlfriend with the heart around it. It's kind of like that same kind of vibe yeah. that we're going on here. So it's all about harmony, harmony and love Yeah, here today on Professional This is a new theme for our podcast, but let's go with it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really sell, yeah, well, we but that's all right. You know, we're, we're still, we're pushing it no matter what. Uh, so uh, today is actually full of nuggets. So we're not going to, uh, we're not going to go, unless you have a nugget off the top of your head that you just want to like throw out there. Cause I know we actually absorbed a fair amount of nuggets in Cancun when we were together. And I'm trying to think of one off the top of I've my got head. One. Maybe you've got one ready and like in the holster ready waiting to go even though nuggets don't come in holsters but uh so yeah so lay it on us what did what did we learn maybe something from uh from our days in cancun together sunning on a couch. well i was going to give you one that i've learned this week uh or learned again uh is online challenges are the single best way to i i think to launch anything if you want to launch a new product a new service a new community a new agency um, the best way to do it is an online challenge. It's the entire sales funnel in one event. You move somebody from the top of the funnel to the extreme bottom of the funnel, and you do so with uh, an unbelievable amount of value. And the nugget within the nugget here is if you run an online challenge, um, you can get really close to self-liquidating if you have a VIP group. So we spent about 50 grand uh, marketing this challenge. And before the challenge even started, we made 20,000 of that back by allowing for VIP. And the way you do that is you run the challenge the way that you saw we did today, Ralph. And then at the end, you have a special Q&A section only for VIPs. And you let everybody know, we had about 450 some odd people in the live group. And we said, hey, if you want to go to the Q&A, upgrade a VIP. And you'll notice a, a tax relevant number of people upgrade a VIP. And then when people ask for the recordings, say yes, the recordings are available only to VIP. If you want the recordings, upgrade a VIP. Every single day, the call to action is to upgrade a VIP. And I would be shocked if we didn't recoup our traffic costs just in VIP sales, which doesn't even mm. compute what we're going to make when we actually go sell the offer, the core offer, which is the, the mastermind. So if you're trying to launch anything, I've never seen anything work as well as an online challenge. Capture a huge audience, make money on the front end, provide a ton of value, build really strong rapport because we give, I mean, unbelievable amounts of value. And you have to be able to yeah. do that too. That's the thing about challenges is you can't fake it. You really got to like mm. carpet bomb people with value. But if you're, if you're capable of doing that, nothing's better than a challenge. So in this particular case, you ran for the, the you versus Google series. Did you, you ran paid traffic to that? I figured you were just pulling from your YouTube no, channel. Dude, we ran 50 rally. grand worth okay. of uh, Google and Facebook ads. I actually think we spent more on Facebook than we did in Google. It was all Google and okay. YouTube. If you want to see our, our funnel just for kicks and giggles, I'll leave it up. It's you versus google.com forward slash challenge. And you can see mm -hmm. the sales pitch. Uh, we just called it the three A live Google ads challenge um, with me and John. And, you know, we gave a very, very rough itinerary, nothing written in stone, um, and just explained everything that they were going to get for signing up for the free challenge. And uh, this isn't the first time we've done this, so we've gotten more and more sophisticated as we go. Um, mm. But, you know, it's a pretty straightforward offer, and it worked really well. So there's something about a challenge that I think taps into a, a deep-seated human emotion of like... It, is it a competitive thing or is it just I I don't want to miss out kind of thing? Or is it because there's something psychological about a challenge? What do, what do you think it is? I mean, I have my opinions on it, but it obviously it works, but yeah, and you have to deliver value on it. But just the idea of a challenge, because I've seen this work in a lot of different niches, like the weight loss niche, especially oh, this is huge. like a huge thing. It's almost overblown, but still works. Right. 
So what do you what do you think the key to it is? I think you, you nailed it with the competitive thing. I think the certain avatars rise to that readily. Uh, I think that if you give people a specific promise in a finite period, that's maybe the most compelling lead magnet type offer. It's hey, you know, lose seven pounds in seven days, for instance. And that's probably too much. I don't think that's healthy, but you know what I'm saying? Lose two pounds in seven days. Um, or make your first dollar in recurring revenue in five days or, or launch your agency in 30 days or, you know, master mm -hmm. the violin in three. reasonable. Yeah. This very specific thing, you're going to be able yep. to play this piece of music in this period of time. There's something about that because everything else feels so inaccessible. It's like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to launch a marketing agency. Correct. Oh, do I have to? Or I'm going to teach you how to pick your agency service. In, you know what I mean? Like this specific output, this specific time period. Um, that's the challenge construct that I think is the most effective. And you know what's funny is now that I'm saying this, we didn't actually do this very well with the U versus Google challenge. We just said, hey, master Google ads in three days, which is obviously a lie, right? Like you're nobody, if you're, especially if you're starting fresh, but we're more or less giving everybody all the updates they need about Google ads. And we're also kind of nerd famous in the space. If you run Google ads, you know about me and John. And so we get to, mm -hmm. you know, cash the check of authority there. But I think challenges work because it's a really specific, tangible output in a very specific amount of time that you can measure. You know, if you say two pounds, seven right. days, I did or I didn't, you know, either you lied or you did not. Um, right. So you, you hold yourself accountable to, uh, to a deliverable. Right. Right. And you as the teacher are going back to that theme to make sure that you are delivering on the promise. Right. right? And the promise like that's that is a headline that's as old as John Carlton or, you know, anyone sort of before him. Uh, but it is it's promise this result in X amount of time. Yep. Y result in X amount of time. I think actually for your next challenge, you could even tighten it up. Master Google Ads in three days is good, and yes, you're cashing in on you know the the amount of authority that you and John have, which is considerable. But you might even be able to make it so that you can say, hey, you know, lower your CPAs and Google Ads in three days by twenty two percent or something. And so we, we should have gone after or, a more specific know, avatar. Like you could go after just e commerce. Uh, ad managers or just lead generation or just agencies or just freelancers. hundred percent. Yeah. And then, yep. and then the promise gets more specific too. Like with the weight loss, the weight loss challenges that work really well are weight loss challenges that go after like, you know, middle-aged women, for instance, or new moms, uh, you know, or recently yep. retired, whatever. Like if you go after a very specific avatar, it, it, it strengthens the promise with specificity. Right. right. Yeah, specificity is key. Learn your favorite guitar song in twenty one days. Dude, that's a, that's what those a great are, that's a great one. Yeah, you know, like those are customer of ours that did that, and he still does challenges for it. I see him on LinkedIn and on Facebook all the time, doing that same sort of thing, and super super successful. So, anyway, so challenges are this week's uh, or this week's nugget. Make them as specific as possible, and uh, definitely check out everything that we talked about so far before we get into the good stuff on the show. That was just a precursor, Kasim, of all the Google goodness, and maybe some offer stuff thrown in at the same time. Today's conversation is going to be a case study that I presented a while back at a large conference um, that has not been released as of yet. So you are going to get a you're going to get a sneak peek Ooh. at this that has not been released as public. Sneaky I think peaky. you have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to get it. We won't even leave links in the show notes to go buy that because you're going to get it here for free. And it's a piggyback on a successful case study we did last year on this show in the services niche, specifically in the law niche, but it can apply to a lot of different areas by utilizing and leveraging the love between Google and Meta. And we are gonna get into that case study right after this quick break.
All right, so we are back. We are going into the Meta and Google Love Fest here today with a case study. And uh, make sure that you do check out our YouTube channel over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube and definitely subscribe so you don't miss anything. You don't miss any of our shorts, any of the stuff that we're putting out. We're putting out hundreds of pieces of uh, highly relevant and personal content as well as on our socials. You know, Custom, I've gotten a little bit more active on the socials on my own side. I know you've been like a mainstay at Custom Aslam everywhere, but yeah. So here for perpetual traffic over at LinkedIn for me, and then obviously Custom on all your socials if you're interested in all that stuff. Today, we are going to be broadcasting this obviously on our YouTube channel. And there's a lot here. And I'll actually I'll give you a link and an email. If you guys don't abuse that uh, to actually get these slides, should you reach out to me specifically, my admin is going to kill me because my email is actually in the lower right hand corner of the slide right now. So uh, anyway, it might not be me who responds back, but thank God for Bernadette and or Heather. All right. Well, we're going to get into this case study here today. This is one that we did, like I said, a year or so ago, and it was all about Google. And I did it with you specifically because I wanted you to poke holes in it. And we'll leave links in the show notes to that previous episode. Uh, we have left out the names of those uh, you know, businesses and anything on the ads here, obviously, for the protection of the innocent. But the point is, is this is something that we're, we're, we're utilizing a highly competitive niche in business, which is personal injury law. I can't really think of too many others that have higher cost per click than personal injury law niche. Can you think of one? Maybe CRM? No, I don't even think CRM yeah. does it. I, I, I've competed in CRM yeah. at a high level because I was the surrogate CMO at Simplero and it was high, um, but personal injury is the worst I've ever seen except for maybe like there's a couple of really high-end industrial products. One of our clients did rugged LCD displays for like yeah. military applications. So if you needed a, a screen for the, you know, Lockheed Martin's building the next battleship or F-16 or something, you can't just put an iPad in that puppy, right? You need like a full on. So those clicks could be thousands of dollars, but there's only four approved vendors all bidding on the same thing. Outside of ultra specific things like that, I think personal injury is the highest of any mainstream business category I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is for me. I mean, I used to uh, bid on mesothelioma <laughs> keywords way back in the uh, the the affiliate days uh, for mass tort law. So that stuff is super. Uh, that stuff is super expensive as well. Not exactly personal injury law, but similar. Uh, that's the only one I think I've ever seen that's more expensive than the clicks that we we get in personal injury. So we've got a fair amount of experience with this because we tend to uh, work with the types of customers that want to do what this one did. And they can, I wouldn't say they can necessarily afford it per se, the high cost per click, mm. but they have they take the longer view. And I think certain personal injury law firms do take the longer view. The ones that you probably see all over the place when you're driving on the interstate billboards and you see them on TV commercials and you know they've got the funny names like the hatchet and the hammer and you know all these sorts of quirks of, of this industry. It it is absolutely cutthroat uh, when it comes to competition in these spaces, especially in densely populated spaces. This is from a state that's in the Midwest and it has that kind of level of competition. So having said all that, this is a good proxy for anyone who has seen a level of success on Google and is looking to expand, especially if you're local or regional, but or if you're national and you want to expand out through some of the strategies which we discuss here on this show, which we refer to as the awareness consideration conversion model or the ACC model which we've talked about quite a bit, where you're blending different traffic sources together to reach not only scale, but also synergy mm. and lowering costs on each individual platform as a result of this strategy. So uh, lots of big promises here, Kasim. So maybe I should get into the details. Prove so it. People realize that we're not totally full of crap. 
Uh, so first thing that we did, like we'll leave links in the show notes back to this original case study. I'm not going to go through all these, but you can get these slides at tier11.com forward slash PI. That's tier11.com forward slash PI. Like I said, definitely check this out on YouTube over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. One of the first things that we did in the case study from last year, and this is the same client, uh, since I've added many, many others uh, in the personal law space with the similar types of, of scale and similar types of challenges and levels of success, is that you have to fix the data. And this is something that I know that you have, uh, and I know John uh, knows that that's the first thing that you do. You fix your tracking. And in this particular case, we used uh, offline conversions, which is a way to get offline data that is not a pixel firing or an event firing, but offline data from, in this case, from their CRM imported back into Google. And in this case, also into Meta in order to optimize for the event that they really and want. What CRM are they in, using, in, just out of curiosity? Oh, geez, you had to ask me. They just switched to Salesforce. Okay. So, and I forget the name of the CRM that they had before. So you'll actually see in the chart a drop off because they actually switched over uh, in the month of September, I believe, to Salesforce, which is which is great because uh, there's an integration. It's, it's a little bit easier as opposed to some of these smaller CRMs. So Salesforce the, is um, the only CRM yeah. that has a direct Google Ads integration. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, well, from within the Google Ads dashboard. Yeah. I mean, there's other CRMs that will integrate from the CRM. But I don't know what Salesforce mm. did in order to earn that, but it, it, it's really seamless in terms of its connection. Mm. That, makes it, that makes it even better. I mean, that might be sort of case study number three once we actually get that because we so we sort of hacked this mm. together. There was, a, there was a lot of different pieces that had to be done in order to make sure that the tracking was fixed. Uh, thankfully, they actually have a very good dev team. We've got an outstanding dev team and we work together in order to fix that. So that was the first thing that we had to do. So we didn't produce these results overnight, just out of thin air. You got to get the basics first. You got to get the foundation in place and tracking is definitely is the foundation. So since we're using um, offline conversions, we were trying to, uh, the aim was to start optimizing our ads for either phone calls or leads, but then ultimately to optimize all of the ads through this offline conversion event for what's known as a signed case. So if you're saying, all right, I'm not a personal injury lawyer, but I am in the you know, lawn care space. You want to optimize, not necessarily for calls per se, but you ultimately want to optimize your ads for clients right. who are paying you money. So for some of the large franchises that we work with, this works extraordinarily well. You start off with leads or maybe phone calls. You track that. You sort of prime the pump a bit. And then you add in, once you have a, a level of volume and a level of scale, you add in that offline conversion event is when the client or the customer is actually entered into the CRM. And this might be a manual process done by a salesperson or by an admin. Oftentimes it is an online conversion, which is great. If that's the case, that's perfect. But sometimes it's a manual thing. So you might have to actually upload these manually or you know, get Zapier involved to be able to zap things back. And to your point, Salesforce does this uh, seamlessly. We do work with a couple of other uh, uh, Salesforce clients, not on the Google side. So it's good to hear that where they're going right now is actually has good integration for Google. And well. one note on the manual importation, I know everybody wants to build things that scale and are automated and that they don't have to worry about. The problem with that is, is especially with the increase in spam, bot, solicitor, and click farm traffic, automatically importing conversions can hurt campaigns as much as help them because you have so many false positives. So what I really like about offline conversion tracking, like you're doing here, manual importation, is a person actually had to look over this lead and say, yes, I want more of these. And that right. ends up being way cleaner data. So I know that you know the, the tactician in everybody's mind goes, oh, well, I don't want to do anything manual, but it's, it's actually really worth that added filter, especially when you're spending the amounts of money these people are spending. Um, just go put a human in between and say, hey, make sure we give this the thumbs up and it's something that we really want. Yeah, clean, clean them up. I mean, I think uh, everyone is so, this is maybe more philosophical in nature than actually tactical for this case study here, but so many businesses are just, let me just automate everything. Right. 
I'm a huge believer. I, I, I talk to my COO about this all the time. It's like, let's just, I am very much a ready, fire, aim individual. Like I want to just get stuff going, see if it works, give me a signal. And then if that signal is positive, then I think of ways in which to automate it. So build things manually first, like handcraft this. And then we did this, we handcrafted it. It was a manual upload to start. I think it was like an Excel file that was used from the CRM. The point is, is that we manually did it and then realized, okay, we're onto something. And then if we get a volume of traffic, then we can automate it. So start manual, go to automation. Everyone is in too much of a rush sometimes to get to automation, which is hopefully where you get scale. But if you're, you know, if you're automating the most or the least important conversion event, then all you're getting is just a crappy business. Right. So you want to make sure that this is done correctly. And I think um, the manual upload makes a huge difference to your point. So traffic wise, so we started to optimize for this. And this is mostly, like I said, this is mostly Google stuff. We haven't even gotten into the, the meta side of the equation as of yet. We did do a fair amount of CRO. We had our, our uh, if you don't know what CRO is, a conversion rate optimization. We did a ton of stuff here. We cleaned up the structure. We put the most important information above the fold on their landing page. We added a phone number uh, at, at the top of it, which was like the most simple thing. People could actually click the phone number and it would click and actually call. Imagine that as opposed to a banner that says click to call and then it goes to another page. Oh, no. So like little stuff like that. Yeah. Like it was a disaster. It really was not, I mean, to their point, they were still, this is still a solid business. Like when they came to us, but the point was, is they were doing a lot of things that were incorrect that we could fix relatively simply just with like one step after another on the CRO side. So clarified the copy, made the, you know, the fonts easier to read that kind of thing. So there was some stuff done here. And like I said, we'll leave links in the show notes or the, we did an entire like six part YouTube series on this. That might actually be, the best thing to do, which is our PI lawyer, uh, YouTube, uh, series. <clears throat> we will leave links in the show notes for that. Uh, the last thing was, is that we realized on the creative side, there's, was really two different avatars. So stick with me for a second here. So picture yourself. This is these, this, this individual, this, this law firm is going after motorcycle accidents, truck accidents, car accidents. So we started with car accidents primarily. So car accident lawyer, name of state, car accident lawyer, name of town, highly competitive keywords. What we found was that we were only getting a certain portion of people who could enlist the services of this firm because those search keywords are done in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe the day of the accident, the time of the accident, maybe on their phone as they're looking at a billboard and it's, you know, it gives them a phone number to call, or maybe they do a quick Google search, or maybe it's within the day or so after. So we found that there was really two distinct avatars, and this is not rocket science by any stretch. Uh, the point is, is that there is an avatar one, it's the person who's just been in a car accident. And then there's avatar two, who has been in a car accident but maybe never called a personal injury lawyer. These by extension, depending on what state you're in, might not be as good leads. They might have been outside of, as soon as you contact your insurance company or maybe go to a hospital, sometimes these aren't as great leads for PI lawyers. So you've got to be sort of careful in the statute of limitations and a lot of other things that have, you know, are, are impactful on the effectiveness of your campaign. But we found those two distinct avatars. What we were getting was the first avatar in our Google ads. The person, the woman or the man has just been in a car accident and they call immediately. They call the personal injury lawyer. That secondary market was where we really felt like there was a lot to be, uh, to, a lot of scale that was not being picked up. And as a result of that, we really hadn't been doing a lot of social media advertising. So we figured this out and we've sort of systematize this in the personal injury law space that they're very, very distinct two separate avatars. Does that make that sense? That makes sense. So <clears throat> let's show the chart here. And uh, this chart actually, you know, like I, I 
say, I forget the name of the, the CRM. But anyway, this is pulled right from their CRM. You can see actually where they switched over to, uh, to Salesforce when I pulled this data out of it, is that in May of uh, 2022, which I'm pointing to here, we were getting about, they were flat. They were getting about 200 or so signed cases per month, which is actually quite a bit. <laughs> They were doing really well as an organization and multi-million dollar business. Point was, is they had momentum. Their Google ads were working pretty well and we were hired to come in and optimize their Google ads in this space with a lot of the techniques that we uh, discussed in the case study last year, which like I said, I'll leave links in the show notes for what the initial results were. And if you can sort of extrapolate this over time, so this is our 2022 line. And then over here, it continues to 2023. So we were getting 200 or so signed cases uh, per month. But then once we optimized our Google ads in this space, we were getting well over 300, 320, 321, depending on the individual month. But as you can see, sort of the curve here, like we got this growth, which is a 50%, which is a significant amount of, of growth from 200 cases per month to 300 cases per month and significant revenue for the client as well as for their, their injured um, victims. The point was, is we had sort of reached a level of flattening growth in the early part of 2023. And so even though we had reached a, a level of, of success, we wanted more. So what we found is that because of those two avatars, all we were really getting was the first avatar, the one who's just been in the car accident, right? Awesome. And we, but we weren't getting the other one that maybe hadn't considered this purchase yet. Notice how I said considered because there is conversion, which we're getting here, but consideration is the next type of campaign in our sort of three-step system that we knew we could attract through social ads. Mm. And that's typically done in a different way and a different methodology than Google pay per click ads. Does that make sense so far? Can I put out something completely off topic, but I think it's really cool. So mm. if you're watching the video, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube, you'll notice there's an ebb and flow and you have four years of data here, which is amazing. You normally don't get that. But there's an ebb and flow, spike in February, drop in March, spike in April, drop in May, spike in June, drop in July, spike in August, drop in September, spike in October, and then it kind of maintains strength through the rest of the year. But for three, almost four years, there's this interesting like uh, cadence. And you think to yourself, well, I know car accidents aren't happening in 60 day cycles. So why the spike or you know why the peaks and valleys and my theory there and i'd love for you to spot check me here ralph and this is why looking at data is fun because you get to guess at stuff i'm willing to bet yeah. dollars to donuts somebody maybe your client maybe your client's competitor has a traditional media spend that's broken down in 60 day intervals and wherever the peak of that media spend is that catalyzes search and digital traffic. And so if you ever look at the way that media spends are distributed, they tend to be according to peaks and valleys into like when shows are, sporting events, you know, this is when we're spending our money on the commercials, radio, television, newspaper, whatever. And so you have wherever the media spend spike happens, the, the, there's some time delay. Sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's two weeks. It depends on the type of event you're promoting. But you'll notice that there's this, you know, Pavlovian flow exactly like you see here and it looks like you guys from a media buy perspective have sort of figured it out like you're riding this wave perfectly which is also why you're you're able to create so much in the way of lift but i just thought that that was a really cool visual illustration of something that i've seen with other campaigns too yeah i mean i i think you know they determine their their media spend 60 days at, at a time in most cases, 90 days in some cases. I mean, we do a, a quarterly business review with them no matter what, but there are some ebbs and flows during that quarter. Um, you know, how to explain all of this, like they're, they're, this is a, 
there's a seasonal fluctuation here too, because car accidents specifically are also related to American holidays. Sure. Uh, so it might be that, you know, the June increase could be because of Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, summer vacation. And then all of a sudden cases coming in. There's or, the, the July like, 4th spike happens in August. Yeah. Right, the July 4th spike happens in August. Maybe the slight increase in October and November is because of Labor Day weekend. There could be that as well. But no, I think this is an interesting chart that – you don't you, you don't see four year charts here. You can actually see sort of where they started. I think you know before June of 2020 they were actually on another CRM. So that's the reason why it goes from like zero all the way up to 200 because they've been successful for some time. But you can see that they had flatlined from 2020 2021 it basically into 2022 and started experiencing you know a rapid increase in signed cases. Like I said, like a signed case for a personal injury lawyer is very, very valuable. That means there's a very high likelihood that they're going to get a settlement from the insurance company and 30% of that settlement goes to revenue for the firm. So we even monetize that in the latter part of this case study here. So, so there was a lot of things that were going right, but we didn't want to rest on our laurels in the early part of 2023 like what's our next step and so we sort of occurred to us this is when we started to formulate this acc strategy that we've talked about here at perpetual traffic for quite some time is that pi lawyers tend to build awareness over decades oftentimes over years and years and they do it through you know these types of things that you see on the side of the road billboards you know in this case it's the hammer i think we actually made this one up through um uh, one of the AI tools yeah. here. Mid, yeah, this is a mid journey uh, generated. Don't get nailed by insurance companies, the hammer. I, I like this one. Uh, so it's very non denominational here. But the point is, is PI lawyers do a really good job of top of funnel awareness. We weren't quite ready for awareness here. We wanted to take a middle path because usually when we see conversion campaigns capping out or conversion campaigns looking like they're starting to maybe taper off or flatline or just not be able to grow. We will usually amp up the consideration side of our campaigns, which often is a middle of the funnel conversion. And in this case, for PI lawyers, it is applications, okay, not signed cases, or it is leads, or at the very top, it's phone calls. Mm. So these are mid-funnel consideration type of conversions, not the end result, which is signed cases. That would be an actual conversion, which turns into a signed case, and then potentially, you know, money for the for the for the victim and obviously for the law firm. So we said, okay, we've sort of hit this wall here. Let's get ahead of it a bit in March of 2023. What can we start doing in February or into March? That'll get us to that next level of scale. And you see that over here on perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube, you'll see the arrow going from cases, signed cases in the 300s, low 300s to well over 500 in a matter of six to seven months. And that is a huge <laughs> increase in, once again, a regional area. We're not talking about a national campaign. We are really just expanding into more of the region where they serve, grabbing a hold of those secondary people who maybe aren't calling right after the car accident. Maybe you're considering it, maybe lying on the couch, you know, feeling still sore, their neck hurts or their knee aches, or maybe the medical bills are piling up searching for alternate ways in which to remedy their current situation. So uh, so we found that that was definitely the case. And that's how we expanded the market from uh, what was a tremendous result of 300 plus cases per month to well over 500, as you can see from the chart. So what happened? <clears throat> what was it? And as we have alluded to, it was Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. So we started playing, <laughs> started playing in the Facebook ads sandbox here in February. Remember in our previous slide here, you know, we were looking at March things kind of, they were flattening out a bit 
in the early part of 2023. So we started running Facebook ads, meta ads in February. And we ramped up from about a $7,000 a month ad spend. You can see here February 1st um, of 2023, about seven grand a month to about 75 grand a month. So a pretty dramatic increase, like a 10, almost a tenfold or a little bit less than a tenfold increase here, an additional 60, well, almost $70,000. I think I said $60,000 today, but really an additional $70,000 in ad spend on top of what was a considerable Google spend. So that is what we did. We started adding this in as a secondary layer and custom. You would think that these would be these types of ads that we usually talk about. Like they would be video ads, right? Video awareness, but no, the ones that really worked were plain old image ads with copy that really isn't all that, I would say, original in the personal injury law space, like get the compensation you deserve, no fees until we win. But we ramped this sucker up to the tune of in this very small geographic area, literally in a state, we did 16 million impressions for 1.3 million people, which is a very high frequency. If you can do your math here, that's a 15 or 16 frequency. So we flooded the market with this message in very broad targeting. Uh, yeah. And it was really with just rotating in these kind of bland, you know, not very exciting types of ads. And uh, it absolutely worked. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, before I get into uh, the next sort of stage here, any any questions that Just you have? Just a comment. My Google if you told me before starting, we're going to run personal injury ads on Facebook to supplement our Google ads, I would have told you it's a bad idea because it's a search based interest. Somebody goes to Google. Nobody's rolling around Facebook saying, oh, I sure hope an attorney advertises me today. I would have just assumed this was not going to work. And yet here we are, the proof being in the pudding. Not only did it work, but it worked phenomenally well and it juiced Google beyond what Google was able to juice itself. And so I think what this means is for our listeners, if you haven't tried Facebook recently, if you've been really successful with Google and you haven't tried Facebook recently, so much of what's changed in the Facebook ecosystem, where Facebook has had to go, how Facebook's had to prioritize its its messaging and placements and users and segmentation, I'd I'd give it another shot because this is just yeah. really strong proof of the way that, like you're saying, Ralph, Google and Facebook can interact and can co-create. And if I had to guess, and this is just a guess, but I'm willing to bet the fact that you have the Facebook pixel installed on the site. I think Facebook is using your on-site analytics to determine who to market to within Facebook. So it's using its own mm -hmm. customer match capabilities to see like, all right, well, who's going to the website? Who's converting? And based off of what we know, because otherwise, how on earth would Facebook target? There's no other, there's really no other reasonable or logical explanation. So um, yeah. I think this just is something of a, a strong indicator that Facebook is using different tools and it's really worth revisiting if you haven't used Facebook in a while. Yeah. And this is the idea of one platform helping mm -hmm. another, because if we look at what they did over this time period between February and September, the only thing that we did differently, aside from we continue to optimize their branded search and we continue to optimize their Google keyword phrases for, you know, personal injury lawyer, name of town, name of state. We were obviously doing that at the same time, but the really the big change was just this. And it just shows the fact that the, the platforms do work together. And if you think that you're media buying in silos, you're mistaken. Right. There is this waterfall effect for both sides. Now, what this was able to do is that because of these consideration ads, yes, we were gathering name, email, in most cases, we even tried Facebook lead ads, which didn't work quite as well, but it was just these straightforward, you know, get the money that you deserve, staying in front of somebody. You know, we got 
a fair amount of leads here. But the point is, is that what we're really doing is driving these consideration ads to the bottom of the funnel conversions over at Google, which then ended up being, you know, the six inch putt for Google. Mm. And in most cases, we were able to lower our overall cost. And I'll show the costs here in just a second here. But most of our conversions were happening for their brand name for their name specifically, because we had created the consideration and a level of awareness over on Meta. And then as soon as they go over to Google and Google the name of the law firm, boom, what do they see? They see our ads. And as we started to increase the volume of that, our costs really started to go down. So here's sort of the incredible statistics. And you know, I got to give the, the Google and our meta teams and, and uh, Nick Miller specifically leading that team over at Tier 11, all the credit in the world for this. I'm just the lucky guy that gets to be able to present it here on uh, you know, perpetual traffic. So if we look back, you'll know what this looks like. This is inside your Google ad account or the MCC. This is March to August of this past year. And if we highlight some of the metrics, we go right into it. Our cost for our Google ads in the time when we ramped up our Facebook ads stayed the exact same. Mm. The, we did not spend any more on Google, on search, on branded search, on uh, high, com highly competitive keyword phrases. None of that mattered. What did happen, and you can see that we spent about $224,000, which actually isn't really as much as you would have thought. Point is, is our conversions increased by 98%. So almost doubled with the same spend with only an increase in spend of right around $70,000 on Meta. So there was the trade-off right there. Google ad spend flat to down. Meta spend, we 10 x it from seven grand to 75, 75 grand, but our conversion numbers almost doubled. And that was the thing that really sort of turned this whole thing around. Our conversion rate on our ads, on our Google ads, all of a sudden went up 40%, which is somewhat unheard of unless you are just a CRO master. Mm. But the only thing that really changed here, once again, like they didn't ramp up any of their billboard ads. They didn't ramp up their magazine ad spending. They didn't ramp up their TV ad spending. It was only on, on Facebook. And then the uh, cost per conversion started to decrease. So in this particular case, it dropped by cost per conversion decreased by 50%. And over on the next slide here are signed cases. So cost per conversion for uh, uh, cost per conversion was for leads signed cases increased by 67%. So we're getting more signed cases for the same money with only an increase in $70,000 or so over seven months on Facebook. So sign cases all, you can see actually cost per lead. Uh, we got a ton of leads here as well. On all sign cases, the cost per lead actually went down 40% cost per sign case, uh, which is a really good number, like $408 for a cost per sign case is absolutely outstanding, yeah, 411 yeah, it's like crazy good because the we'll do the math here in a second here. But the point is, is everything else stayed flat except Facebook. It's the only thing that we ramped up. Now, to this this client's credit, like they were, as we were increasing from seven thousand to twenty thousand to thirty thousand to forty thousand per month on Meta, they were very patient. They said, "We're going to trust you guys. We know this is on the long game." Like, like I said before, I mean, we had a slide that showed. Personal injury lawyers, sometimes it takes tens, dozens of years for some of the ad spend to sort of come back to them, especially with expensive billboards by you know certain highways with lots of traffic flowing by it. The point is, is these guys were six, six months was a very short period of time for them to wait. But for us, we were you know doing our thing and obviously we we're starting to see the results almost immediately by the month two or three, we started to see some positive signs, which culminated in September being the best September that they've ever had. So uh, 
really getting the, to the heart of this, all of this is like, if you try and monetize it, what does this all mean? What does this mean to the customer? Well, you have to actually think to yourself, okay, if I increased my customers by X amount, what is it worth to me? Well, in this particular state, uh, the personal injury verdicts in the state, which has been blurred out here, the average is about a million dollars. The median is about $99,000. So uh, average obviously is somewhat skewed by the huge cases that happen, like the the ones that you hear about on the news, like, oh, $10, $12 million settlement or whatever it happens to be. Some states are far less than this. Okay. This is a state that's actually fairly lucrative from a personal injury law standpoint. It might be because these guys are really good and they know what they're doing. Uh, it might range from, you know, 25,000 to 200,000 in your state. I'm not saying this is all all the case in all states. The point is, is that what does this mean to these guys? If we increased, we got 546 signed cases at the median of $99,000. That's 54 million in settlements, $54 million in settlements to uh, their clients, which means 30% of that goes to the law firm and that's 16 million in revenue, which is about the average. So, uh, if we look at this sort of by a more exaggerated metric, and these numbers just look almost like ridiculously silly here, Kasim, these guys made $178 million in revenue based on an increase in $70,000 of ad spend. That's a pretty good return. <laughs> I mean, that also, <laughs> so somewhere in the middle there between $16 million and $178 million is probably the right figure. The point is, is the return on this client by just slightly shifting their strategy, putting a little bit more budget on a relatively unproven platform, which is all really, really top of funnel, more consideration than in the moment, like you said before, hey, I've got a broken pipe and my, my toilet's flooding. I need to call a plumber. You're not going to go to Facebook for that. You're going to go to Google, right? So it's the same kind of thing here. Hey, I've been in a car accident. I'm going to go to Google. Well, a lot of their customers go that way, but a lot of them that we found end up needing a little bit more consideration a little bit later on. And that's the reason why uh, the meta side of the equation works so well. So those are staggering numbers. If you really look at the total return, it's in the thousands of percent. But uh, the next phase for us is... Uh, the awareness phase, we did the consideration side of the equation, but if we sort of look at our timeline here, Kasim, and you can see this over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube, we're doing this consideration type of campaign right now. And our next level of scale, which we just started, is on the awareness side, where we're launching Facebook ads and meta ads that are top of funnel, no call to action, literally. And those are the cheapest ones because there's no call to action. We're not using the website conversion objective here. So that's sort of the next phase, because right now we're right around here, uh, October, November, in the entire journey. So uh, that is the case study for uh, for this week. Any questions, any uh, poke, poke holes in this, you know, as the, as the Google guy here, you know. Feel, feel free to throw some well, arrows. Well, I think I'm, or, I'm I guess, beyond arrows. I guess you shoot some arrows. My question really is, is this your only PI client? And why wouldn't you go get one in every state? Because you guys have clearly cracked the code here. And it's such a valuable niche. Man, I, I, I'd go niche down and get 49 more of these suckers. Yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, we've gotten a fair amount since the first case study. That is... That is a consideration. Do we want to be known as a personal injury law agency? I think, you know, the one of the things that we really enjoy about this client in particular and the ones that we've been successful with is that the end result is that you really are, I hate to say it, you're using these platforms for the betterment of mankind to a certain degree. Like some of the, some of the videos that, that, they have, as far as their own case studies of how they've been successful, it's pretty staggering, like how it's affected people's mm. lives. So yes, that is a, is a big consideration for our marketing department. But 
Uh, trust me when I say there's been plenty of personal injury law firms that have come out of the woodwork um, since we started presenting this sort of stuff because not a lot of them go after this type of thing. They go after the lead and the phone call, which right. is fine. You know, you can you can make hay with that. The the one detractor to this that I will say is that if you're a PI lawyer and we have had a fair amount of inquiries for this, where you just can't stomach. You, know, you can't fathom the idea of spending twenty thousand dollars on digital to grow your business. A lot of this just doesn't work. You have to have much more of an abundance mindset, and so we've seen some of the larger law firms excel. The smaller ones, it's harder to make all of this well, here's work. My argument it's to far them more is, challenging. I'm a somebody in a personal injury case, and I can't stomach thirty percent of my gross to a PI lawyer. You know, and now the lawyer's going to be like, well, you don't understand. The better the lawyer, the more you get. And now I turn that table on them and say, see here, sir or madam, why don't you take your own medicine? Yeah. It's a hard thing. Uh, and I've been on lots of those consultations with PI firms that, you know, we, we you know, they see the results here and just the idea of spending $10,000 a month is a hard thing. And that'd be very hard to make work, you know, cause there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into yeah. this. Like this, this is a team of nine people, seven or eight or nine people. Well, and it on takes this months to permeate and they have to be patient and communicative. And yeah, yeah, you really do need the right client here for sure. But I will say this is that even if you're not a personal injury lawyer and you're listening to this, or you're, but you're a VP of marketing for a service-based business. This works no matter what. Like we're doing this in many other niches aside from just PI law, where there is an offline conversion, where there is a high ticket sale, which also involves some kind of consultation, like in the health and wellness space, in the spa space, you know, in the franchise space. Like all of this, like selling a franchise is a big mm -hmm. deal. Like we use the same thing for franchise businesses to be able to sell their franchises. But, you know, because of the size of the payoff, typically you have to invest upfront. And we saw the payouts here for this, for this law firm. Like there, there is no doubt in my mind like that, those numbers are absolutely accurate. It's somewhere between 17 million and 178 million. That's a major payoff, but they had a cash outlay and the patience to be able to do it right alongside other media, which they are doing. And ultimately we're able to scale and grow and get to that next step. And that's the reason why they're crushing it in this market and in their particular market. But yeah, there's 49 other markets out there you know, many of which we serve right now that we would love to be able to do the same thing with, but you got to, got to approach it with the right mindset. This is really awesome, dude. This is a great case study. So, so yeah, so there you go. So we'll leave that uh, for you. Make sure that you do check that out over at perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. I'll also leave some links in the show notes where you can get the, it's an eight part video series on the first part of this. If you want to delve deeper into it, and uh, get into um, you know how you might be able to do this for your PI law firm on your own, or if you need our help, obviously we're here to help you there over at tier11.com. Uh, so make sure that you do uh, subscribe and leave a rating wherever you're listening, and um, follow us like we said before on on our on our socials all up the place at Casa Muslim and every social known to mankind. I think you're just making up social networks I now am. to just yeah. Don't get, forget to get follow me on Twitter. The yeah. flubber. That's right. <laughs> I, I, you know, it just, just, make, just, yeah. The, wherever there's a social network, that's there's right. Qasim. At Qasim Aslam. Uh, me over on LinkedIn, that's Ralph Burns. Go back and listen to previous episodes. Like I said, yet again, check out our YouTube channel, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. All resources and show notes are at perpetualtraffic.com. On behalf of my awesome co-host, Qasim Aslam. Peace. Until next show. See ya.